Just because I'm a founder doesn't mean that I have a right to be the CEO forever. We should always look at leadership teams or all teams for that matter to be kind of seated with people that are fungible. And I think that that starts with the CEO. What does this organization, this like set of systems need to be really successful? And am I even that right person? This is season five of In Good Companies from Cadence Bank, the podcast where we talk business to help you get where you want to go. Here's a stat for you. Recent research by Deloitte suggests that 80% of CEOs are able to maintain vision and optimism, even when faced with global uncertainty. In other words, the quality shared by most corporate leaders is a capacity for reinvention. But is that really what makes a great CEO? Today's guest has his own answer to this question. I think it, it has less to do with the idea that like any one type of CEO is the right one what is more likely to result in success over time is if there's like a deliberate effort put into looking at what that leader's strengths and weaknesses are and then building the team in a way that is complementary, right? This is JB Soseda. JB is a longtime entrepreneur and the founder of Western Willow LLC. And in business, he's what you would call a shapeshifter. I'm a serial entrepreneur, I've had multiple businesses over my career, uh, but now I primarily spend my time helping business leaders and entrepreneurs gain traction towards their visions and their goals. From working freelance as a successful commercial photographer to hosting the Texas Country Reporter on national TV and building and selling multiple businesses, JB has spent two decades cultivating an innovative approach to leadership. Now, he works with entrepreneurs and CEOs to build their vision. And that means two things. One, defining their philosophy. And two, implementing it with the right process. A company is a set of systems operated by a group of people. That is a company at its core. And oftentimes, people believe they have a company when all they really have is a group of people. And so that aspect of like kind of seeing large groups working and trying to suss out like what's working or not working amongst these groups and what are the kind of core root problems that are are like plaguing the teams and making them ineffective, like that's the stuff I love. In this episode, JB reveals what makes a successful CEO. We unpack what an entrepreneurial background can bring to your business, reflect on the value of feedback for decision making, and discuss the importance of community and empathy in leadership. JB also shares his personal journey as a CEO and shows us the true meaning of the word opportunity. The way that I've always just kind of viewed the world is a series of opportunities. I'm not someone who's really takes a lot of stock in the idea that what you did yesterday has to define what you do tomorrow. I've always just wanted to spend as much time doing things that I found interesting. And when I didn't find them interesting anymore, moved on to the next thing. And so started in commercial advertising where I had been a commercial photographer for about 10 years. And I spent most of my time working with large ad agencies and magazines around the country. I shot for Wired and New York Times and Getty, Southwest Airlines, a lot of uh, larger brands that people are familiar with. And ultimately kind of made this realization that I was only making money when I was working and that was going to be a a difficult thing to scale, especially as I got older. And so I sort of fell into the retail business, started a, a Twitter account that blew up and started selling products to that audience and then realized that there was an opportunity to help other brands like mine with the shipping and the fulfillment of orders. And that turned into the logistics firm called Salceda Industries that I sold a, a couple of years ago. Seeing JB's depth of experience, it's easy to think that leadership came to him naturally. But he'll be the first to say he wasn't born with it. And in fact, when it comes to corporate leadership, no one is CEO on day one. I was a dumb early stage entrepreneur and I like put CEO on my business card when we had three people. And I tell people all the time, that's like the silliest thing a a founder can do. Like chief executive of what? Uh, it was in name only. It was on my card because I needed a card to give to vendors so they knew who to call to pay invoices and make decisions. But 
there's so much to be figured out, so much to be worked through. You're barely qualified, especially in your first business, to pick out where everybody should be going to lunch, let alone developing some big corporate strategy or, or like wearing that title. So in the early, early stages of companies, you're an individual contributor, much like the people that you're hiring. You know, you're in the weeds trying to figure out how to go to market, what the team should look like, what our culture is like, what our values are, like all of these like super nitpicky things that will eventually become the responsibilities of lower level people like within your organization. But there's very little time to be thinking about the future in this big grand strategy because, you know, day one, you're just trying to figure out how to get the first customer in the door. So you're making some like rough decisions about what your product needs to look like or how you're going to go acquire those first few customers. And with time, as you grow a team from the center out, then there is more high-minded strategic development work that develops. Was there any particular event or any, any particular thing that happened, you know, or the kind of a turning point where you were going with that idea of what the CEO should be? Yeah, I, I think it was joining entrepreneurs organization and being in the room and around other people with, you know, bigger businesses or businesses similar size. Because, you know, when you, when you start as a, a founder, it's a pretty lonely proposition. I mean, you're involved in the weeds with your customers and your employees all the time, but you're going home thinking about a lot of things in a vacuum. And if you've never built a business before, like how you do it the right way, how do you have meetings, how do you set agendas and like strategies, et cetera, those are all, you know, net new experiences that people are trying to figure out on their own. And so joining Entrepreneurs Organization really leveled up my thinking because, you know, we were probably around 1.5 million in revenue, something like that. We had, I don't know, 10 to 15 employees. And I wasn't getting too big for my britches, but I was certainly feeling my oats a little bit more and feeling really confident about where we were as a business. And then I got, you know, alongside some other entrepreneurs and realized like, oh, wow, we've got actually a lot of room to grow here. And these are things I should be working on and finding out that how other CEOs and other founders were spending their time really just sharpened my thinking and helped me figure out where to prioritize. It made me realize like how much more valuable I was at that stage as the business was getting bigger, spending less time in the weeds next to my employees and more time on the strategy. Like what is the vision that we're building to and why? So every day that I'm not in the warehouse and with my team directly, they can kind of figure it out. And like, I'm leaving enough space for them to make those decisions and kind of figure it out on their own. So first lesson for the good CEO, build from the ground up, not the other way around. Spend time in the field with your employees. Figure out your team's dynamics. What are your strengths? And what do you need to complement your leadership skills? Take scope and be realistic. That's how you build an effective strategy for your company. I think every company has different CEO needs. There are really great operationally led and financially led companies that happen to be really creative. The ultimate deciders are financially and, and operationally focused, but I think it, it has less to do with, with the idea that like any one type of CEO is the right one. What is more likely to result in success over time is in the role is if there's like a deliberate effort put into looking at what that leader's strengths and weaknesses are and then building the team in a way that is complementary, right? Like I, I actually think that that managers and leaders to some extent, like they have a responsibility to be shapeshifters and adaptive to the culture and the people that they're managing and leading. You really learn the saying two ears, one mouth matters, right? Like, you know, we have we should be listening more than speaking. And and there are moments where my job was to lean into being that person who is like getting us all to coalesce around a vision. And then there are moments where it's like time for me to shut up and let the team speak and and just be there to kind of nudge and say, hey, we're off track or we're on track, et cetera. So it seems that you, you view the uh, leadership role, you know, whether it's CEO or anywhere, the leadership role, a little bit more from a creative lens rather than just a, a directing lens. Why do you think that is? I mean, I think I actually have a firm belief that like, no, <laughs> there, nothing should be sacred at a business. And, and that starts with like the people that sit in the seats. You know, it's like shift from kind of like, this is the wrong person, like they don't belong here at the company to... We actually have the right person. They're just in the wrong seat. Or like this seat, we don't even need it. Like this is not a resource that we need. Or, hey, there's this work that's spread across 17 people that we've totally makes sense for it to be one person and for us to hire that person that looks like that. The business itself and what it needs might be different than what my skills as a leader can provide. Just because I'm a founder doesn't mean that I have like a right to be the CEO forever. We should always look at leadership teams or all, to all teams for that matter 
to be kind of seated with people that are fungible. And I think that that starts with the CEO. And it's really like, what is the company, what does this organization, this like set of systems need to be really successful? And am I even that right person? So according to JB, leadership is really about flexibility. A chief officer should have a bird's eye view over their team and know when to interject to move operations forward. It's someone who's unafraid to step in and shift things around. Because above all, a leader's focus is on the needs of their business. And sometimes that means getting out of the way. Everybody loves listening to the Steve Jobs interviews where he's like, you know, the the thing we did at Apple was hired really great people and then got out of their way. And like everybody loves that. Like leaders of companies think that that's what they're doing. Uh, but they don't like they they hire really great people and then they kind of get in their way and you know they sort of believe that the CEO title is like a carte blanche for you to just act however you want and the big idea guy is actually really disruptive and is more of a bull in the china shop to the day to day operations of getting the like trains to run on time. The way I lead is I I need a, a team of really good people to pick up the pieces because I have an idea and I kind of get you ninety five percent of the way there but then I'm start having another idea and I need everybody else to to be able to grab that vision and, and take it forward. One thing I would add to that is like the leadership piece has less to do with like defining how exactly we're going to get somewhere and more to do with being the person who's good at kind of getting above the canopy and pointing out where you're supposed to be going and trying to see around the corner and then like connecting the dots between the long-term distance and destination with what you're focused on today. Connecting the dots. For many CEOs, this is the real challenge. It's easy to have an idea for where you want to go, but to turn it into a plan that stands the test of time, that's another can of worms. So lesson number two, to build your vision, get organized. Process documentation is so critical. It doesn't have to feel like a Boeing 747 like instruction manual for this like TV show thing that I do, Texas Country Reporter. Like, we have a super straightforward process that we developed. And this is for like something that's fairly goopy. It's like, how do you make a good story for a TV show? And the process is straightforward. We submit a basic summary pitch. This is the thing that we're going to do a story on. Here's the person it's going to be about. And here's why people should care. And that's like the, the pitch. It's like fairly simple. And two people are going to decide where we focus Everybody will, you know, give a final thumbs up and then we divide and conquer the work that way. Like that's the process, right? But at a minimum, like now our meetings can be 30 minutes instead of two hours of us just talking in circles and being like, do you want to work on that? Or, you know, it's like we, we kind of work on the right parts in the right order. So we're, we're in the right mindset as we hit each step, right? If we're going to talk about dates, why don't we talk about it at the point of the meeting in which everybody has their calendar open? right? Instead of the one guy who's like on his phone and this person's still talking on the pitch. And, you know, so if there's anything I brought from the creative industry, it's that like, there's actually way more of a process around creative endeavors than what most people think. Taylor here with your weekly tip. Did you know bank resources like receivables lockbox can help you improve your cash flow management? With the receivables lockbox, payments are sent directly to a special post office box monitored by your bank. They are then picked up and immediately deposited and posted into your account. This can speed up the posting of your receivables by days, even weeks. Learn more at cadencebank.com. All things considered, JB's approach is pretty straightforward. Assess the needs inside your business and build your systems accordingly. Then adopt a creative approach to weather ongoing changes in the landscape. And if you need help, take inspiration from other leaders. I think that actually of all the people that had a big impact on me, uh, Patty McCord, who famously wrote the Netflix culture deck with Reed Hastings, like in the mid 2000s, her like philosophy on work and the workplace uh, had the biggest impact on me, I think. Some context here. If you've never heard of Patty McCord, there's a few things you should know. She's known as the woman who reinvented HR at Netflix. She got on board with the company in 1998, only a year after Reed Hastings co-founded it. As chief talent officer, Patty brought Netflix's corporate culture to life until 2012, and her approach broke new grounds. (music) 
she was there in the very early days. And there were a series of things that I think are really important. You know, the first of which was they built this like streaming platform and suddenly everybody's able to start watching Netflix online. And, you know, basically Netflix was kind of the first thing out there, kind of like YouTube, and it was eating up all this bandwidth. And Reed, the CEO, had heard that internet service providers were coming to them and basically saying, like, you guys make up like 90% of the data that's on the internet every night. And if you guys keep growing at the pace you are, you're going to break the internet. And so he came back to his engineering team and said, hey, we've got to like rebuild this thing from scratch. And we got to figure out how to like basically deliver the same quality video, but for less data. And so he asked his team, how do we do this? And they're like, oh, it's going to take a year. And he said, we don't have a year. So he went out and he spoke to Amazon, AWS, and they told him they could build it in like three months. And so they did. And he turned around and he and Patty talked about it. And it was like, well, it doesn't make sense for us to still have this internal engineering team. And they let go of that whole team. And this team went to her and their response was like, I can't believe I'm being let go. Like I was on this team that built this thing that is the future of the company. And her stance was like, exactly. Go use that to get a killer job somewhere else. You know, like look at what you did and what you accomplished here. Just because you built it doesn't buy you a seat on the train forever. And, you know, now the business has a need, this like specific need to meet this objective within this time. And, and for, you know, unfortunate reasons, like you and the team can't do this. But that's okay. Like this can just be a simple business decision. You know, she she talks a lot about the number of those people who all got picked. It was like, oh my God, we're going to go grab that team that built the thing for Netflix. And now these people are the CTO and the CIO and all of these like huge, they've done incredibly well for themselves because they, they understood that businesses are living organisms that change and, you know, they have healthy moments and not so healthy moments and whatever. So yes, Patty McCord's vision for culture and performance was radical. But she upheld this standard in her own work, too. And spoiler alert, eventually, it caught up to her. Her and Reed used to go to some event every year, and it was in January, and they would always share a bottle of wine. And she would always ask him, if you had to hire for my role today, would you hire me again? And she said the answer was yes every year until it wasn't. And one year, he said no. And the business that had started as a technology company to facilitate DVDs being shipped back and forth and then ultimately a streaming platform had shifted. They'd, they'd kind of done the software, done the technology. Now Netflix was becoming a movie studio. It was basically like producing quality content was their job, their primary job. And a head of people, a recruiter whose primary skills was steeped in recruiting engineers was not well suited to recruit Hollywood talent. And suddenly she was out of a job. So she's like sort of famously known for being let go by the, own, the same culture and principles that she developed. But I, I think that that's really incredible. I think of it as healthy and human and empathetic. When you develop a system that operates that way, that's actually the kindest thing that you can do because everybody knows the rules that you're playing against. So lesson number three, a good leader abides by the same rules as everyone else because that's the right thing to do. This work of kindness is what JB leads with in his own ventures. There's a difference between being nice and being kind. And uh, being nice is to placate and pacify. And being kind is to care deeply about somebody or something enough to challenge it and like make it better. If you trust somebody deeply, then you're actually okay with them coming at you with a little bit of energy or, or like a challenge and making you better because you know and you believe that they like have your best interests in mind, right? Like the, the purest form is actually like your grandma who will tell you that they think that the thing you're wearing is really ugly, but like you don't take offense to it because it's your grandma and you know that they care about you like more than anything. That is actually to me the purest form of like kindness is like establishing that trust so deeply that like you can just be really honest with how you feel about the person, you know, and what they're doing. Honesty is a stepping stone to achieve better results inside your company. But here, JB also touches on another component of successful leadership, embracing change. Everything about your business should not be operated like a jazz performer, you know, kind of off the cuff, with like a, a rough understanding of what key you're in. Like you actually want this to be more symphonic in nature because it's not enough to just hire people and then kind of say like, great, we're running, you know, but like if, if you've got these like people that are so incredibly good and you're fearful that they're going to leave, probably tells you something about whether or not you have good systems, you know, because if you have really good systems, 
you want great people to stay, but you're not scared of them leaving because you recognize that like you'll find somebody else. The the person who's leaving will be better for it. They're going to go do something else that they are really excited about. And I think that that's just kind of the nature. It's like, you know, you, as an employee, you want to feel like you're moving forward. And at some point, you might not have anything else to give to a specific role. And it's totally reasonable to want to leave. I don't think that employees should be scared about looking for opportunities elsewhere. I think that's good. Um, and it creates a healthy relationship with their employer for them to know what they're worth. And then I think that it's also important for employers to just know that like they shouldn't be scared that there's some turnover. Turnover is good. It's, it's a healthy thing. I always view it as if you can coach somebody to the point another company wants them and advance their career, that should be viewed as a as win for you. And maybe a temporary loss for the company, but then you'll find somebody else that has those skill set plus where you're going. But I think that's something a lot of leaders don't embrace. And it sounds like you feel like feedback is a big, big part of that process. Feedback is critical because it exists even if not spoken, right? Like people have opinions of every, about everything. If it's not out on the table and there's not some means with which it's being processed by everybody involved, it can create really unhealthy relationships and, and working dynamics. So I, I do think it's a, like a pretty important step. Feedback is an invaluable tool for growth. As a chief executive, it can help you improve business performance and cater to your team's potential. So sit back and ask yourself, what information do we need right now? Some of it is the simple stuff, right? Like I posted something on Slack and people gave me a reaction emoji to it. To as deep as like, I want you to build a deck about what you've been working on project-wise and all the different tripwires associated with the project. And then we're going to get together and talk about it. Like all of those are important pieces of feedback in a corporate environment. At our business, we decided that we were going to do twice a year baseline surveys. We did one extensive survey about all of your experiences at our business that gave us our kind of baseline net promoter score. We did it every year, same week of the year, regardless of what was happening. We didn't decide, that, oh, the team had a really hard time this week, so we're not going to ask them this week. Like we're, we're asking the same time every year. And then six months, we would do a shorter version to just kind of pulse check it. And in between every quarter, we do a focus on some hot spot that was an issue in the previous baseline. You know, so if like in the yearly baseline, a lot of people brought up issues around communication and like collaboration, then we're going to do a shorter, small survey that's focused on that specific issue. That was our process. That was the way that we did it in our business. And as a result, we had a, a certain type of feedback that was really constructive. Here's an important word, constructive. Receiving criticism is a big part of the feedback process, but it's far from easy. When we sift through emotional responses and negative assumptions, we can get a little scattered. But if you really want to tackle the issues inside your company, consider JB's next advice. Grow thicker skin. Because I think like one of the other fool's errands, or not fool's errands, but kind of fallacies that I, I see a lot of leaders kind of get overconfidence on, I, I certainly fell in this camp, was the belief that everybody was really honest with you. At the end of the day, you are still everybody's damn boss. So like you are not getting the 100% truth. And that's okay. That's actually totally okay. There are things that you get as a leader that are like really beneficial. And that's one of the like not so fun ones is like not everybody can be perfectly honest with you. So for me, I think like growing a thicker skin is important, especially if you're going to open yourself up to the like anonymous survey. But good Lord, I like I still think that as hard as the anonymous surveys were to read, they made me better. And they made the company better. It wasn't just for me. I mean, this was like about the company. My tendency was to want to like, as, as the survey started rolling in, to get in there and want to read all of them. And my wife, who ran people for us and was very principled about how we handled that, she didn't give me access to the raw data. And she would make me wait until all the information came in so I could see it together. When you see it together, it's like a little easier to ingest. You're like, oh, this is actually a real issue versus you reading this one person who's maybe being a little sharp in the way that they criticize the thing. And you're like, oh, who the heck was that? I want to like... I want to talk to them. I can, I can solve this problem. They just tell me who it is. And that's not actually the way to manage the business. You know, a CEO's job is not to play whack-a-mole. Instead, a CEO's job is to make choices, plain and simple. And that's our final lesson today. If you're a leader, always keep your eyes on the prize. Focus on your goals and use feedback to reshape your strategy.
there are some places where like you should make the call because like you just know where the business needs to be. And then there's some stuff like benefits, you know. I remember when we were working on healthcare for the first time, making decisions about like whether we do healthcare or not, uh, or like pay for it at that stage. We actually surveyed the company because we thought we were, everybody wanted it. And what we found was like for our company and the age of the employees, which were mostly early 20-something-year-olds who felt like they were invincible, their feedback was, I'd rather that money go into a 401k or I'd rather that money go into this other thing. We're like, here, my wife and I, who are getting a little older, having kids and stuff, are starting to think like, oh, healthcare is really important. We found out from the actual population people were most affected by this decision that like it wasn't. Like we ended up still deciding to do the healthcare, but it made us budget for it differently. And I don't think had we just spot asked people, they would have like surfaced that. You know, if I'd gone to everybody and said, do you, do you want healthcare or not? They'd probably go like, oh yeah. But then if you reposition that question, you say like, we have limited budget for benefits because of the business and industry that we're in. And these are the things that we're thinking about spending it on. Stack rank, which ones you would prefer. People go, oh, well, if, if I have the choice, like I'd actually rather have better snacks in the break room and a 401k. And that like, you know, not only did it help us land on the better decision for the employees, uh, it created more buy-in for them because they saw a thing that they put into a survey end up resulting in like an actual thing taking place. Ultimately, JB's leadership model is all about community. Every leader needs support to make the right choices and grow better together. And to make that happen, you will need trust and empathy. You know, I'm a big believer in Patrick Lencioni's five dysfunctions of a team. And you know, one of the, the concepts that he really drives home in that book is if you have an absence of trust, then you have a fear of conflict. People don't really want to head things off, you know, head to head, which means they're ultimately not going to be super committed. They're going to avoid accountability and not really care about the results of what happens in the business, right? So it like creates this like shaky platform. So at the core, if you can really focus on on fostering the trust, the rest will fall into place with the right practices, like having a beer with your coworkers or, you know, going offsite for a clarity break just to walk around the building. That stuff is what builds the trust. And when I come in and I challenge you on a thing on your performance or you challenge me, like I don't take it personally because I recognize and believe very firmly that you're here for my best interest and I'm here for yours and, and for the companies ultimately, right? So I, I think that the community thing is really important. And I think that it'd be silly for people who are running companies to not consider the fact that the people running the systems of their companies are people. And if you're not cognizant of that, then you're going to get into a position where the system breaks through its own rigidity. And, you know, when, when people talk about really great companies and the places they loved working for, the theme that you hear over and over is like, I really love that boss because they just seemed to get me and they spent a lot of time developing me and they were curious about how I felt. That's all empathy, right? And so to me, facilitating and creating the opportunities for, for us to empathize is, I think, the core of what motivates me every day. And just like that, JB brings us back to the very start, creating opportunities. That's been the driving force of his career. So if you're a budding entrepreneur or a CFO in need of inspiration, here is JB's roadmap to corporate leadership. Every company has its humble beginnings. It will take time to get your vision off the ground. So start by working hand in hand with the rest of your team. Look around and get a feel for your company's skills and needs. When you know what you're working with, you can start thinking about strategy. As you grow, be mindful of your processes. It's easy to get lost in the details, but a CEO's role is to give the company direction. So elevate your perspective, get organized, and adopt a flexible approach. Sometimes that will mean getting out of everyone's way. Remember, just because we've always done things a certain way doesn't mean it's the right one. The only constant is change, and that applies to everyone in the business. So as time goes by, adapt your systems to meet new challenges. And to make the right decisions, gather feedback from your teams. When you give your people a chance to speak their minds, you create a climate of trust and empathy at all levels. And that's what you need to grow better and bigger in the long run. Last but not least, keep in mind that leading is not a gift. 
It's a skill you can hone. So when you're not sure what to do, remember JB's mantra. Clarity is kindness, both in personal and business relationships, and, and perfection is not the goal. Constant improvement is. We would like to thank JB Soseda for sharing his creative vision with us today. His career trajectory and business philosophy are an inspiration to us all. Want to experience In Good Companies in a whole new way? Check out our podcast on YouTube. We're posting full episodes and some exciting new bonus content, and you'll be the first to know. Search Cadence Bank or click the link in our show notes. In Good Companies is a podcast from Cadence Bank, member FDIC, equal opportunity lender. Our production team is Natalie Barron and Edie Pengeli. Our executive producer is Danielle Kernell. This podcast has been in collaboration with the team at Lower Street, writing and production from Lise Lovati, narration by Daria Lawson, and sound design and mixing by Ben Cranell. This podcast is provided as a free service to you and is for general informational purposes only. Cadence Bank and its affiliates make no representation or warranties as to the accuracy, completeness, or timeliness of the content in the podcast. The podcast is not intended to provide legal, accounting, or tax advice and should not be relied upon for such purposes. The views and opinions expressed by the host and guests in this podcast are solely their own current opinions regarding the subject matters discussed in the podcast and are based on their own perspectives. Such views, perspectives, and opinions do not reflect those of Cadence Bank or any of its affiliates or the companies in which any guest is or may be affiliated. The production and presentation of this podcast by Cadence Bank does not imply the expression of any opinion on part of Cadence Bank or any of its affiliates.